So we've got some news since our last meeting. Uh, the auto update for the three people in the world who still use desktop Java runtimes. Um, they're going to update, all three of them, from Java 7 to Java 8. Uh, not quite silently, because the thing Java loves to do on Windows is prompt you about stuff. So it's going to prompt everybody who's got JRE 7 installed to upgrade to JRE 8 on Windows and Mac, starting earlier this week. So I think we, we already got that prompt on our home computer. You, you may see it soon if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, when it upgrades on OS X, it will delete JRE 7 in the process. On um, Windows, it leaves it there, but changes all the defaults to JRE 8. Um, doesn't affect Linux or the JDK on any platform. Uh, in related news, um, Oracle will stop releasing public updates for Java 7 in April of this year. So that's usually kind of a soft date. I think with Java 6 support, it kind of hobbled along for about 18 months after they promised to stop supporting it. Because it's, yeah, it's, it's worse in the news if you don't patch a security vulnerability. But the official word is that security vulnerabilities will go unpatched starting in April. So, uh, In still related news, there's a new update to Java SE. Um, update 31 disables SSL version 3 by default which is an old protocol that you're not supposed to use anymore because it doesn't work. Um, and there's attacks, that, like man in the middle attacks, where you can force a downgrade from TLS to SSL3. And what's that? I suppose, yeah. Poodle, yes. What does Poodle stand for? It was like paddling Oracle over legacy, or downgrade to legacy encryption somethings. So anyway, yeah, that was Poodle. So Oracle responded by turning off SSL v3 finally and all their stuff, including Java. Right, TLS. Get in the habit. Uh, and as with all JREs, it has an expiration date where it will, again, because its job is to prompt you about stuff, it will add an extra prompt after April 14th to say that you're running an old version, because that's when the next scheduled update is. Um, so Pivotal, that, I should say that's, that's my new employer, and I'm not representing them on this particular item, but Pivotal announced shortly after I joined them that uh, they're going to end <laughs> funding. Entirely coincidental. Yeah. <laughs> and we're supposed to sorry, Ross. <laughs> As Dick Wall said, I love the groovy. That's all I could say. So, um, yeah. March 31st will be the end of funding of the sort of core Pivotal, or core Groovy and Grails teams from Pivotal. They're still 100% committed to their projects and are now looking for new corporate backers. So if you are a corporate, email them and give them your money. They want it. Uh, there was a neat uh, blog post from Joe Darcy, who's uh, one of the core Java developers. He spent a bunch of time recently removing all of the Java C compiler warnings from the entire JDK code base. <laughs> so it is now free of Java C warnings. They have uh, all warnings set as errors uh, when they build the JDK. So uh, he wrote uh, an article about what he thinks is the best approach for doing that in a large code base that has lots of warnings in it, like the JDK code base used to. He says, go one warning type at a time rather than one module at a time. And as soon as you get all the warnings dealt with, either by adding a suppressed warnings annotation or actually fixing the problem, set that warning type to an error, and then iterate, start on the next warning type. Um, and uh, he's got specific advice about each type of compiler <laughs> warning on his blog, which is linked there. Uh, that's all I found for news since last we met. Anybody got something I wanted to share? No? OK, so let's hear from Mike about Apache Solar. And afterwards, we'll hear from Don about Adopted JDK. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. 
so as John said, my name is Mike Pettypiece. I work for Street Context. Uh, the obligatory plug here is that we are uh, hiring a junior developer. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, please uh, come talk to me after uh, tonight. Arthur to talk tonight. So um, first off, we're just going to cover what Solar is. So Solar is a, is a search platform built on top of Apache Lucene. For those who don't know what Lucene is, it's a, a high performant, full featured uh, text search engine written in Java. So it's designed to be highly reliable, scalable, and fault tolerant, as you would expect. And it's based on a NoSQL database. So a little history on Solar. Solar was uh, created in 2004 by a gentleman named Yannick Seely at CNET. The reason that he uh, created Solar was because they were using a commercial search engine that was being discontinued, so he needed to find a, a replacement for it. In 2006, CNET donated it to the Apache Foundation. Uh, 2010, because the, the Solar and Lucene projects pretty much had the same core committers, they combined the two of them, though the, the downloads are still separate. And then the big news was in 2014 uh, when Solar Cloud was uh, released. And this was basically um, a result of Elasticsearch, uh, which uh, had uh, much better distributed capabilities to Solar. So this was Solar catching up to them. So first off, I'm just going to go over a few sp uh, Solar specific terms. So uh, one thing you'll hear often is uh, Solar Core. So it's basically a running instance of the Lucene index, along with all the configuration files that go with that. Uh, so uh, solar servers can have one or more cores or indexes, um, and they typically run in isolation from each other. So what is a Lucene index? So it's a uh, inverted index, so it maps uh, terms that it, it finds uh, to the documents that they occur in to allow for quick uh, text search. For example, if we were indexing Toronto Java user group, the, uh, it would, uh, as document number one, you would have a Lucene index with uh, group, Java, Toronto, and user all pointing to uh, that, in that document. So it's sorted in uh, alphabetical order. And it also uh, contains the terms positions in the document in this uh, for doing some interesting search queries. Another key thing to understand in Solar is the request handler. So everything in Solar comes in over HTTP. And in your solarconfig.xml, uh, you configure these request handlers. Some of the interesting ones that we'll be talking about tonight, the update request handler. So that's what we use when we're indexing our content. Uh, the search handler for actually processing our search requests. Uh, there's also a replication handler for replicating between uh, your different uh, slave and, and leader nodes. But there's many, many, many other ones. So this is a very abridged version of what your solar config would look like. This is just talking about the request handler. So it's kind of similar to those familiar with uh, your web.xml pre servlet 3.0, where you're uh, uh, registering your, your servlet. So uh, we've got the, the search handler is bound to the uh, slash select URL. You've got the update or indexer to slash update. And the replication is, is tied to slash replication. So in this talk today, we're going to talk about three main sections about using solar. First thing is about getting our data uh, or defining our data structure or the schema of it. Second part is getting it, the data into the, uh, your solar index. And the last bit would be actually performing searches on this data. So first thing you, you want to forget about um, when you're using solar is that it's nothing like a relational database. You don't want to uh, normalize your data. Uh, in order to increase your speed, you want to duplicate your feeds, fields whenever possible. So no foreign key relationships at all. A solar document is a flat denormalized structure. So each of your document needs a unique identifier, just like your, your database primary key. This is used when you're updating your document as well. Uh, that's what you're going to reference it by. Each field has uh, a name and a field type. 
and there's two extra properties uh, available on fields, uh, whether or not the field is queryable, I indexed, and whether the field is stored. So stored fields you can't search on, but they can be returned as part of your search. And as I said down there, you can uh, both in have a field that's both indexed and stored. So field types in your relational world, that just be your column type. Two main types, there's your structured non-text fields, such as date, string, boolean, uh, and then all your int types as well. These aren't, the very, these aren't very interesting ones here. They're just stored as is in your, uh, uh, in your index. Text fields are the ones where solar e show, uh, shows its power. So this is unstructured text that needs to be analyzed before you index and search on it. So an example of, uh, of something that would be, say, like in a string field versus a text field would be like a language code. Uh, if you had like your, your standard ISO language codes like EN and FR, you'd store that in the, the uh, string field, uh, where if it was like a, you're indexing a tweet, you'd put that in a, te a text field because you'd want to do queries on uh, the contents of the, the tweet body. So apologies if you can't read this. This is, this is a, a schema.xml. So this is how you define your schema in Solar. So at the top there, we've got our fields. You can see the names and the types up there. One thing we didn't talk about were uh, dynamic fields. So if you're really lazy and you don't feel like listing all of your fields, you can create uh, dynamic fields here. So what this is saying here in the, the first dynamic field, uh, it says star underscore s for those who can't read it. So any field that ends with underscore s is going to have a type string, it's indexed, and it's stored. The next section is just defining what my unique key is for my document. And then we list all the types. So in this case here, the type uh, string maps to the class uh, solar.string field. Solar dot is actually a shorthand for org.apache.solar.schema, if you're actually interested to see how it's implemented. Now down at the bottom there, the uh, text general, you'll see a lot of extra information there about the analyzers. We're gonna cover that uh, a little later on in the talk. Uh, one other thing you can do is you can also have uh, a field that is multi-valued. So this would allow you to have multiple values for one particular field. Okay, so that was uh, defining your schema. The next thing we need to do is actually get content into our solar index. So as I mentioned before, indexing uses update request handler. It's a REST API that supports posting JSON and XML. I believe there's also ways to get CSV in there if you want. Uh, and there's a ton of client libraries. Uh, SolarJ is the most popular one since it's a Java one. There's a .NET one, a Solar, uh, excuse me, a Ruby one. Uh, there's even some Scala ones for the Scala developers here. And this is sort of an example URL that you'd actually be posting to. So um, we, we talked about binding uh, update to the uh, slash update to the update request handler. Collection one in this case is the actual name of the core, so um, that's where that comes from. So this is uh, examples of the XML and JSON format that you would actually use to post. Uh, shockingly, the, the JSON is a little bit less verbose than the XML. But again, you know, we're listing the fields and the actual content that we're passing in. Okay, so that's not the only way that you can get data into, uh, into your solar index. Uh, the data import handler is a very useful uh, use case. This is uh, the main approach that we've been using. So it allows you to import data from your relational database. So you've got two approaches. The, th the thing they tell you about first is you need to have three queries. So one query is your initial import. Then the second one is to fetch the IDs of new and changed documents, and a third query to fetch all the changed data, which, especially since your first and third queries are probably just about uh, identical, uh, doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So there is a way to do it in one query, which is the approach that we took. So here's uh, an, an example of a data config. You define your data source at the top. Nothing too crazy there. And then uh, you can see the query there. So this is the query that we use for getting data in. Um, 
the data import dot request dot clean. Um, if you pass clean equals true to your post, or excuse me, when you're calling the data importer, um, it'll actually blow away your index and start fresh. Um, and then the other thing to note there is the data importer to last index time. So every time you run the indexer, it'll put the last index time um, or make that available to your next call. So in this case here, what I'm saying is um, if the create date is greater than the last index time, it's obviously new content and I want to put it into my index. Now I lied a little bit here. Uh, the deleted, uh, the, I do have two queries. There's a, something called the deleted PK query. So that's a query that gets run and any IDs that match that are removed from your index. If, so if you need to find an easy way of removing uh, content from your index, this is a one approach you can take. And then again, we've got the field definition. So the fields mapping the columns to your actual field name down at the bottom. Uh, you don't. Uh, uh, you don't need to load it from a database. You can also load, use this uh, mechanism to load from files as uh, well. There's just a slightly different uh, syntax for your, your data source. Um, you can do XSL uh, T transformations as well. And you can also write custom transformers that process your content as you're pulling it in. So since, we, uh, since my company is dealing with emails a lot, uh, we wrote something that goes and parses the mind body of the content that we're indexing. So that would just be specified as another uh, element or another attribute on this uh, on the entity uh, element there. Okay, so when we're uh, indexing our our content, uh, we need to analyze it in some way. So typically, you would want to ha create two analyzers: one for when you're actually doing your indexing, and the second one for analyzing the queries that you're passing. So an analyzer consists of two things. First thing is a tokenizer. So the tokenizer takes your, your stream of data or your data and produces a stream of tokens. And then that passes the, to the second part, which is the token filters. And the token filters can transform any of your tokens, uh, can remove them, can inject new ones if necessary. Now this is uh, also, this is configured in your schema.xml. So uh, this is uh, back to what we were talking about before. So in this case here, we've got, you can see the analyzer for index and query. Uh, they're basically the same. They both use the standard tokenizer factory. And uh, then there's a couple filters applied here. One's a stop filter factory, uh, then the lowercase filter factory. And the only difference between the two is that we actually run the synonym filter factory when we do the query. So what do these guys actually do? Standard uh, tokenizer factory uh, splits on white space and punctuation and removes leading pound and at signs. So for some use cases, this might be sufficient. If you're, say, uh, consuming the Twitter, uh, Twitter tweets, probably not all that useful because you would lose all the hashtags and at mentions. So there's also another one called the white space token factory, which just splits on white space only. And there are a ton of other ones available out of the box with solar. Now, what kind of token filters are we dealing with here? So lowercase filter factory, uh, shockingly, this lowercase your tokens. So you don't want people, when they're searching on your index, to have to uh, you know, know what case they're, they're actually searching for. So this will lowercase all your tokens. The stop filter factory is useful for removing uh, tokens that have no real relevancy, such as common words in the English language as uh, the, then, there, et cetera. And these are all configurable by, uh, by the solar administrator. There's also the uh, ASCII folding filter factory and ICU folding filter factory. So that transforms characters into the ASCII equivalent, because most of the time your users won't <coughs> create or use the, uh, the correct accent when searching for resume, for example. So this will just uh, remove them, um, any sort of, or any, any characters that it can. Uh, I think the, the difference between the two is that the ASCII folding fil filter factory only works on Latin character sets, while the ICU one tries to work on all Unicode types. Uh, there's also the, uh, sorry, does anyone else have any other questions? Okay, so uh, K stem. So that's uh, your stemming. In this case, it's the Kravitz stemmer. Um, and so this transforms words into their base form. 
So drink king would become drink, which most of us are doing right now. And then there's the synonym filter factory. So uh, this is one so you can actually uh, create a list of synonyms for common terms for whatever your, your uh, data set might be. Um, so, you know, if you were uh, dealing with stock tickers, if you saw Apple, you might want to put in AAPL. And there's a lot more of these. Okay, so how do we actually perform a query? So this is, again, an example URL of what you might uh, see. Um, again, we're uh, using the search handler. So there's two different query parameters here. FQ, which is the filter query. So this just limits your results to the set of matching documents that fulfill those, that, that query. And the Q1 is a more useful one. That's the one that limits results as well as using your query parameters for relevancy scoring. So returning your more relevant documents higher up in your, uh, in your, in your return list. So why, would, why do we have two of these? So the, the filter queries can actually be cached. They're typically things that happen over and over again. Um, and you're preventing unnecessary uh, relevancy calculations uh, for being made on those particular fields. So that was making a query. Then that gets passed to Solar's query parsers. So there's, there's two commonly used parsers, uh, the Lucene query parser and the EDIS Max query parser. Uh, typically, it does the. Uh, uh, the, the question was uh, which gets processed first, and typically it's the the filter queries, right? So it it basically that it returns a set of documents that match that filter, and then it runs its relevancy scores on the remaining document that are left. So uh, the Lucene query parser is a Solar's default query parser, um, and it's. Syntax is, as I said, they're strictly enforced. Uh, so if you pass in a query that's malformed in any way, you'll get a parse exception. So it's really not user friendly, especially if you're allowing your, your users to enter text into a search box. Another issue with it is that uh, values, or your query always has to be against a specific field. So in this case here, uh, name colon Apache Solar, it's looking for the phrase Apache Solar in the name field. Uh, it, if you wanted to look in the name and the title field, you'd have to say name colon Apache Solar uh, or uh, title colon Apache Solar. Uh, if you want to make it, so we're just going to sort of go through and how you do certain uh, search searches here. So if, it, if a term is required, you can either add the plus, you can uh, say uh, use the and keyword or the ampersand ampersand. Again, syntax is strictly enforced, so you can't use lowercase ands. Uh, for optional terms, using or or two pipes. Uh, one thing you can do, there's another parameter you can pass called uh, DF, which is the default field. So that sort of gets away from having to, you're still only looking against, if, if a field is not listed in your, in your query, it'll go against the default field. But again, you're still only searching against one field. Uh, you can do grouped expressions. Uh, if you need to exclude a term, use minus or the not keyword. You can also do range searches on your data. So you can search, this is a date, is obviously a date in this case. Um, it's got some nice uh, helpful syntax. So now plus seven days will automatically be evaluated to the current time plus seven days. Uh, you can also do, uh, so a square bracket is an inclusive range and the uh, curly braces is an exclusive. You can also do wildcard searches. Now you got to be careful using doing wildcard searches, uh, and that sort of goes back on how the Lucene index is actually set up. So, if we were just doing hello star, star, that's actually extremely fast in Solar because, as I said before, the indexes are alphabetically sorted. So it just needs to go down to hello, and it can quickly find all the the terms that match that particular query. 
If you did something the opposite, if you did star hello, it has to search through every single term in your index. So that can be extremely uh, cost prohibitive. Now there is a solution around that. You can actually create um, or add a new filter, like we talked about earlier, called the reversed wildcard filter factory. So what this does is it effectively doubles your index size, um, but it'll put every term in your index twice, once forward and once backwards. So it's a, it's a way of getting around that. So fancy ones that do like blue filtering or something? Uh, not sure. So what else can we do in the uh, Lucene query parser? Uh, term proximity. So we talked earlier about the Lucene index actually storing uh, the location of terms in the document. So by using the tilde, uh, tilde and then a number, you can uh, look for phrases that are found by moving no more than n positions. So Toronto user group there matches Toronto Java user group. So the, the one term move would be actually inserting Java in there. You can also do the same thing with uh, uh, edit distances on an individual term. So uh, edit distance again being a uh, deletion, insertion, or a transposition. And if you know that a particular term is more valuable than others, you can actually boost the relevancy of that particular term. So in this case here, I'm saying solar is roughly 10 times more relevant than actually finding just Apache. Does that combine with the character? Oh, no, it doesn't. I guess you could explicitly combine it with the character proximity if you wanted. Yeah, yeah, you can group that. OK, so that was the Lucene query parser. So the EDIS max query parser is the extended disjunctive maximum, which is a pretty a big mouthful. Um, it, so it's a combination of the Lucene query parser and the dis disjunction max query parser, which has pretty much been deprecated in favor of this one. Much more user friendly than the Lucene query parser. You can search across multiple fields by passing in the QF parameter. Though the one thing you need to worry about is, or the one difference it has, is that it only scores your documents based on the top scoring field. So the Lucene query parser scores based on adding the scores from each field. This one will only return you documents on the, on the top field. So I just want to quickly go over a few other solar features. Um, out of the box, you can implement spell checking. So um, you can ret return results that are close to what they actually, if, if you don't return, or if you don't find any results for their search, you could say, do you mean, and then returns <laughs> some actual data, similar to what Google does. Um, you can do hit highlighting. This is uh, quite useful. So not only do you get back the documents that uh, match your query, but you'll get back a snippet of the document with the terms that were matched in the search results. There's also type ahead uh, auto suggest you can add in, and uh, more like this, which would return similar documents that the, inter the user may be interested in. Similar scoring for, for that particular uh, terms. So solar cloud. Um, so again, this was in response pretty much to Elasticsearch. It's a large scale solar cluster. Um, and so they have what they call a collection, which are multiple cores that make up one logical index uh, using typically sh you're sharding your index across these different cores. So it uses, uh, for those uh, that are into the big data space, you're probably familiar with Zookeeper. So Zookeeper coordinates the servers and handles the configuration. The cool thing about this is that you can actually add servers uh, via Zookeeper, and they don't need to know anything about the configuration at all. Zookeeper will pass down any, any config files that they need. And it does a horizontal scaling using sharding and replication. So you still want to vertically scale your servers uh, as much as possible. To, uh, you, you know, the more memory you have, and if you're using fast SSDs, you're definitely going to see uh, better performance. Uh, but at a certain point, you can't vertically scale anymore, so this allows you to shard your index and uh, split across multiple servers. Yeah. 
So each shard has one leader and zero to or zero or more replicas. Uh, who here is familiar with the cap theorem? So it, it's basically this this big thing in distributed systems. Um, CAP stands for consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. So um, what, what it basically says is you can get two of them. You get two of the three. You can't get all three. It's impossible. And you need the P, the partition tolerance, because that's partition tolerance is basically your servers aren't able to, to contact each other. So you, you pretty much have to choose between consistency or availability. Uh, Solar doesn't allow you to choose that. They've made the uh, decision that you're going to get consistency. So what that means is that when you index a document, um, it gets first it gets sent to the leader, and then that synchronize the leader synchronizes it uh, uh, among all of its uh, replicas or slaves. Until that actually happens, uh, the doc document is not committed, and if that fails for any reason, because they've chosen consistency, so you want to be able to whatever server you go to, you want to um, make sure that it, they, they all have the same data. So uh, if any of your replicas fail to, to commit that uh, document, uh, your whole index fails. Um, queries, you, you can send your queries to any leader or replica, uh, even of different shards. So you can just load balance across all your, your solar instances, um, and it will be, uh, all the, the correct data will be returned to you. And again, you can uh, index any document with any server, and it gets cr sent to the correct leader. Do you know what it uses for consensus? Um, on, on what side? On the, on, on the zookeeper side or on the, uh, on the I'm not sure of the solar side. I know, the, I know the zookeeper stuff. Like, so again, now you're using zookeeper, and, and that requires that you. Uses like what's that? Zookeeper uses Paxos. Well, it, it, it's what they, they call it ensemble. So it, you need um, it needs a majority. Uh, so if you want to allow one of your zookeeper, so all zookeeper instances actually need to know of each other. So if you want one to fail, you actually need to have three instances going. If you want to have it be able to continue working, if two fail, you need five. Um, if the zookeeper servers go down, it's not the end of the world, except that uh, you can't really add any more. Like, Solar will still respond to requests and stuff like that, but you won't be able to add any, any new servers to your cluster. OK, so uh, I just want to do a quick uh, Solar versus Elasticsearch. So these are both very similar pro pro products. Um, they're both based on Lucene. Elasticsearch was kicking Solar's butt for a while because they were designed around sort of a distributed approach, though Solar has now caught up with that. One interesting difference is that uh, Elasticsearch is schemaless. So, you know, as all Java developers, we should love schemas, um, strongly typed and all, but uh, if it depends on your, on your data set. You, you, you probably like Elasticsearch better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one neat feature that uh, Elasticsearch has is called percolator support. Uh, so what this is, is it allows you to actually index your queries. So you could take your query and pass it into the index, and then every time you add a document uh, to Elasticsearch, it'll return you the queries that actually match that. So it's a really cool way of actually doing some sort of like alerting or rules and stuff like that. Uh, you know, from a personal standpoint, the reason I chose Solar over Elasticsearch, so uh, I did my investigations about a year ago. Uh, for us, you know, our main data store is a Postgres database, um, and the I found that the data import handler was the cleaner approach and the easier approach to get going. Uh, Elasticsearch has something what they call the JDBC River, but it's not part of the core project. It seems more of an afterthought. Uh, it's just a plugin that you can add in. But they're both uh, very good products. So the last slide, I just want to sort of say, you know, why don't I use a relational database instead of all this, this work with Solar? So you, you can do with like clauses, but relational databases really aren't set up for this. Um, <coughs> it's uh, li multiple likes are very expensive. And more importantly, it just returns you whether or not it, has, it contains the term or not. There's no way for it to do sorting based on relevancy. And that's one of the, 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 the key features of, of Solar. 
There's another article called uh, Postgres Full Text Search is Good Enough. So I've linked down to it there. I'm not going to show you any of it because it'll make your eyes bleed. <laughs> so it is possible to use Postgres. Postgres does have functionality, but it's a maintenance nightmare. You know, just because you can do something doesn't mean it's the right approach. Um, you know, you can write your server app in JavaScript if you want, but it's, I don't know if that's the right approach either. <laughs> Ruby. Oh. <laughs> Nothing but from this guy. Uh, you could run a uh, Rails and MySQL application too. Oh god, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that's it. So, do you guys have any questions? Thanks, Mike. Okay, so um, if you were at some of the previous meetings, you probably heard about Adopt a JSR. And so this is just a really short talk about what's been going on recently. So basically the story behind it is that Java EE8, the process started in mid to late 2014. And uh, so the previous release of Java EE7 was very successful. So Java EE8 is going to build on the very successful Java EE7 release. And we'll also include a lot of new functionality. And uh, there's a really good article that I found about this. It's an informative, concise overview of the plan. It's written by Aaron Gupta. I, I forget where he works. I think it was Red Hat or Oracle. But anyway, he published, sorry? It was both. It was both. He just switched from Oracle to Red Hat. Okay, I wasn't confused. <laughs> so um, he published this article in September of 2014, so it's pretty recent. It's entitled Java EE8 is Kicking Off. And it gives a really good overview of all of the stuff that they're planning on putting into Java EE8. So I put a link in here, and it's not that long. You can read it. It takes you five minutes to read, so it's really worthwhile. Um, so. What this talk is about today, it's just to summarize one of the Java EE8 <coughs> online meetups that were held with some of the JSR spec leads on December 19th, so it was uh, a recent meeting. And uh, I gave a link to this. Uh, JCP.org is kind of the central website, along with Java.net is also a really important website. But JCP.org has a multimedia page, so there's the link for it. But if you just go to JCP.org, you can just click on the multimedia page. I think the link is on the top right of the page. And uh, on the multimedia page, you'll find the talks for each JSR in a separate audio file. So they did this so that the format allows each Java users group to share the presentations their members are interested in, so you can pick and choose. So the next slide I'm going to show you just shows a layout of the multimedia page. And I'll, I'll give you a tip. Use Shift-Click when you're clicking on the content links. Otherwise, it, it just uh, it doesn't allow you to see the content and the, uh, and the presentation at the same time. So the multimedia page is pretty straightforward. In the title column, if you click on the title, it'll actually take you directly to the, the JSR itself, so you can read all the details. Um, the time is helpful. You know how much you're going to spend. Um, the audio link will give you the MP3 link. So again, use Shift-Click on those so you can open up more than one link at a time. And then the presentation materials are optional. If they don't have any additional presentation materials, the link will usually take you back to the JSR page or some of the presentations like the, um, I believe the JSF, for example, they had a really good slideshow that was associated with the presentation, so you'd probably want to look at that if you, if you give it a listen. So the agenda for today, uh, again, on December 19th, the online meetup, they discussed four of the Java EE8 JSRs in detail. So today we're going to review one of the presentations, and we'll briefly mention the others. The JSRs are in the early stages, so this is the current state of affairs, and things will change. So the four JSRs that they talked about, first of all, was JSR 371. This is the Model View Controller, or MVC 1.0 specification. So we're going to review this one today. I just picked one randomly. It's brand new technology for Java EE, and there's a lot of interest in this JSR. The other JSRs that they discussed at the meeting were JSR 369, which is Java Servlet 4.0 specification. Um, this is a really interesting one. It's bringing HTTP2 to Servlet. It's the first update of the HTTP protocol in over 15 years. It's a very exciting JSR, and particularly if you're big into multimedia or 
internet gaming development, I think this is a really interesting JSR. Um, JSR 365, uh, it's context and dependency injection for Java 2.0 version. Uh, they want to allow context and dependency injection to be used outside of a Java EE container. So particularly for Java SE developers. Um, so this is going to be of interest, I think, to all Java developers, whether you're Java EE or Java SE. It's very interesting. Uh, um, how many use CDI? So it's really cool stuff. I only learned it like just a few months ago, and I just love it. I think it's great. So JSR 372. I didn't mention much about this because there was no particular highlight, but it's about Java Server Faces 2.3, and uh, um, the presentation was really good. There's a good slideshow associated with this, but basically it, I felt listening to the presentation, it was more of an incremental update to Java Server Faces. So he reviewed what is the current state of affairs, what are the current issues with um, user interface development for web apps, and then he talked about how Java Server Faces addresses those issues. And uh, so I found that a little bit interesting because I've been learning Java Server Faces. I'm not going to call myself even beyond the novice stage yet, though. So JSR 371, oh, beef, did anybody have any quick questions before I go ahead? I talk pretty fast because, no? OK, so JSR 371 is the model view controller uh, 1.0 specification that was pre presented by Manfred Rehm. I hope I pronounced that right. So why have an MVC JSR? Uh, MVC is a common pattern in web frameworks where it's used predominantly by HTML-based applications. The popularity of the MVC pattern together with data collected in a recent Java EE survey, and I didn't know what survey that was, but I should look for it. But it's prompted the need for a standard in this area. And this is a very popular JSR, has a very active user list. I would just add to that, like, why an MVC JSR? Like, who here has used struts? At some point. <laughs> At some point. Yeah. And so that's like sort of why not standardize a thing that can do that? Yeah. One of the other things that came up, and you'll see it mentioned um, a little bit later, was the fact that Java Server Faces is a component based framework. And so the, the MVC framework, it's action based. So, web UI frameworks, they can generally be categorized as action-based or component-based. So this framework defined by this JSR falls into the action-based category, which I believe is similar to how Struts works it. And it's not intended to replace the component-based JSF. It's a simply a different approach. I had kind of wondered why they didn't really talk about JSF. Why not have some interoperability between the two? But maybe they're just going to test the waters and see how it works out. And maybe in the future, they might consider having some association between the two. But I don't know. It wasn't mentioned. So for JSR 371, so for MVCs, the technologies that they plan to use, when possible, they plan to leverage existing Java EE technologies, such as context and dependency injection, bean validation, Java server pages, and facelets. Um, the, the expert group, or EG, still has to decide on JAXRS, which is no longer true. Actually, in January, they did decide um, just a, a few weeks ago that they were going to use JAXRS for the controller as the controller technology. They'd also considered um, using uh, the con defining the controller in a way that's independent of the technology used, but in the end, they settled on JAXRS for that. And does anybody know what JAXRS is? <laughs> what, what is it? declarative way of making um, RESTful APIs in Java servlets. That's right. So me personally, I don't, I'm not really familiar with JAXRS too much other beyond the, the basics, but um, they feel that this is a good approach for a controller. So that's what they're going to use. And it's out of scope for this JSR to define a new view templating language. So existing languages should be evaluated. Possible, uh, I think that service provider implementation, uh, possible service provider implementation could be defined as extensions for the language. So right now, the expert group is focused on what approach to take. They did decide on using JAXRS just earlier in January. So the spec leads are going to focus on specification and implementation. And for the rest of us, the user list discussion is the most important thing right now. If you have ideas about MVC, 
then it's a great place to be able to input your ideas. Um, they have a number of tasks that they identified, so ad adopt a JSR task specifically. So until there is a reference implementation, the user list will be where the activity is going on. Um, there is a, a mailing list for this JSR. It's rather buried in the text of the JSR document. But for this project, the mailing list is at java.net, as I think many others are as well. So I gave the link for it there. And in order to subscribe to the list, you just need to log into java.net, and then you'll see a subscribe button beside the, beside the mailing list. If you don't log in, you'll just see the mailing list, but you won't figure out how to subscribe. So one of the big things that they need help with is writing documentation. In particular, the user's guide will be a lot of work because this is for version 1.0. And they've said in the, in the talk they want to write the user's guide in a style similar to the JAXRS user's guide. So if anybody is familiar with that, could be very helpful to them. Other tasks is in the future, in about six months, which I guess now would be about four or five months away, the expert group planned to have the prototype and continuing snapshots of the reference implementation available. They didn't say specifically, but I imagine that might be something related to the Glassfish web server, but I, they didn't say specifically, so I'm not sure. Uh, when the reference implementation is available, uh, write code to help test the actual implementation. Code samples that you write might also serve as references or tutorials for future developers, so your code could be immortalized. You never know. Um, did anybody have any questions about MVC? No? Okay. So just to, in concluding, I just wanted to give a brief overview of the purpose of Adopted JSR. So the Adopted JSR goal, um, the standards process is meant to formalize lessons learned and best practices from Java developers and then to standardize them. So Oracle hopes to make Java EE8 the most community-involved Java EE release in history. The adopted JSR program is designed to make it easy for us to participate in the hope that we will. And so how we adopt, uh, we only talked about one JSR, but there are many others. Um, how to adopt, uh, I would highly recommend reading Aaron Gupta's article for an overview of what is in Java EE8. It was very concise, very quick to read, but it covered pretty much everything. Um, the other thing you can do is explore jcp.org where you can learn more about all of the JSRs and adopt, adopt the JSR tasks for each one. So for each JSR along with the JSR, they have a tab there that shows the tasks that they need help with. And then the other one I didn't write on here but I wanted to mention was java.net. Java.net, uh, there's a lot of references to it and many of the mailing lists for different JSRs are on java.net. So that's also a good resource and then get in touch with your Java users group organizers and coordinators. Um, I put in a couple of notes here. These were videos that I'd watch because I'm learning Java EE. And so uh, this first video, HTTP 2.0 comes to Java, what Servlet 4.0 means to you. Um, Ed Burns was the one who had given the adopted JSR for, for the HTTP 2.0 spec. Um, him and Xinghui Chan, the other, they're sort of co-spec leads on this project. They gave a really good presentation at Java 1 in October, so it's really recent. It describes HTTP 2.0 and the plans for Servlet 4.0, and it gives a really good overview of the technology with some good technical depth. So you can find out, and I think as I mentioned, because Oren was here, I wanted to stress that HTTP 2.0 I think it's going to be really cool for game developers or multimedia developers, honestly. Oh, like, yeah, well, I definitely recommend watching the video. And uh, um, he, he actually talks about a few of the things that you had mentioned in your talk last week. Um, so I, I found it really interesting. And this other video that I found, uh, it's called Lightweight Java EE by Adam Bean. Um, you may have seen him. I think he gives a lot of presentations. He has a weblog. But, uh, what he does in this video is he gives a discussion and code demo based on Java EE6. So it's a couple of years old, but it's still pretty relevant because it presents some of the rationale and history of Java EE, which was really helpful to me, sort of understanding where things are right now and where they're going. Uh, it gives a features overview, and it, he also gives a short code demonstration in the latter part of the video. It highlights a number of technologies that will be further developed in Java EE. So me as a newbie, uh, I found this really uh, helpful video. So that was pretty much it. Um, any questions or comments?
All right. Thank you guys. Thanks all for coming.